Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to be here in Princeton in this occasion and to be part of uh, the organization of this of this conference. Um, I have um, uh, very few comments. In, in fact, um, uh, the, the the table, the, the three talks, that I think was uh, uh, very um, clarifying and, and um, touched um, very. Um, uh, important aspect of um, mestizaging. Uh, my first comment would uh, say that, um, uh, <clears throat> as Arcadio have um, stressed, in Latin America, mestizaging have had different uses. Some of them very progressive, and uh, we should remember, for example, that the first, the first. Uh, 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 invasion of, of the Latin American nations in Brazil, for example, was an extension of Europe. The idea of branqueamento, branqueamento, whitening, was just this idea that uh, Latin America was a continuation of Europe. And uh, I think that uh, this kind of project, of nation project, um, <clears throat> didn't uh, really work mainly because um, the cultural messages was something that was visible for Europeans themselves. So the fact that uh, uh, Brazilians were not Portuguese, uh, that Argentina were not Spaniards or Italians. It, so uh, this, uh, the idea of messages, not, not only uh, um, a cultural messages, but uh, genetic messages, gave rise to the first um, um, nations projects, very inclusive projects. And the archive is totally right in pointing out that uh, it uh, became time very uh, a very reactionary project of nation. Uh, 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 and this is very um, clear in Brazil today. For example, um, the 10 last years when we were discussing a kind of um, uh, of democracy that uh, were more than uh, uh, in integrative, symbolic integrity of black culture, but it was really equal in terms of uh, rights, of the civil rights. Yeah. The question that emerged was, who is black? How to make quota or affirmative action a mixed race country? Yeah. And uh, it, it was not a really uh, important question. Uh, there are 10 years that uh, quotas are in place with all this mixture. And uh, pardos, um, brown people or mixed people, and blacks are both of them subject of, of benefits, benefits by, by, by the quota system. So uh, it teaches us that uh, mestizage doesn't uh, impeach uh, the, the struggle for, for freedom or radical democracy. So we can. Uh, leave this from the past, this kind of uh, reading of mestizage as only um, a disguise for uh, racial inequality, because today it is used for the promotion of equality also. Um, but at the same time, the same experience teaches us that uh, democracy passes by recognizing race as the base for discrimination. Yeah. The project of the 30s and 40s and 50s in Brazil passed by class struggle. All this idea of revolution of a, a new society. Yeah. So nobody would uh, think about race as something positive in terms of constructing a nation. Was the class struggle and the, the values of the people that would lead to a more democratic society. But in fact, what arrived past historically is that race became the real uh, progressive concept for inclusion, for social inclusion, for social justice. So we have to think about it. Yeah. Um, um, and finally, uh, a last comment is um, the challenge that uh, Europe has today facing Mrs. <coughs> in the nation building process of the, the image as, uh, as European, okay, 
that cannot be more exclusivist. Yeah? That is, Europe's not more in more an exception in terms of we colonize and we create mess onwards in the other countries. Yeah? Today, Europe creates mess in its own country and has to deal with this idea that uh, it's a mixed Europe. Yeah? So I, I love the, all the interventions and my comments are just this. Okay. Well, I want to say that it's uh, my pleasure to be here to work together with ASPK and JB. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, JB. We use those this kind of nicknames, and as I'm going to talk about words, it's good to start with nicknames. <laughs> Uh, also, I really like this panel, be three beautiful speeches. I just want you to speak more, a little more, and then I do not have questions, just, just some comments. And I'm afraid that most of them have to do with the idea of word, of misunderstanding of words. <laughs> uh, Pedro started this colloquium talking about the problem with the word. In fact, he said, we are going to have a, a colloquium about mysticizing. And we said, the first question was, what do you mean at this? And Pedro said so. And the second was, do you think that we are going to work here as a kind of, how can I say, minute intelligence? Because Arcadio said that they had no papers, but they have papers, but they do not have the papers. <laughs> so we are trying here, Antonio Sergio and I, to, to try to look very smart and intelligent. <laughs> this is an immediate reaction. So let me try to start with this kind of immediate reaction. Listening to the three of you, I immediately remembered a moment in Alice in the Wood of the Neverland. I'm sure Arcadia knows the moment when Alice has to enter in the País das Maravillas. And then he, she received it from the Humpty Dumpty, two bottles. And the two bottles were reading, drink me. But Alice knew that in one of them, he would be, she would become bigger and bigger and would never end. And in the other one, she would be smaller and smaller and would enter. And then she asked the most important question, how can I know which which of the bottles do I have to drink? <laughs> and how did Dante answer? The person that believes in words is always wrong. <laughs> so I want to start talking about words. Arcadio, that is our master here, that taught me how to think in political terms. Taught me again, that is important to think about it. And it's important to think about, about words that have, that have no meanings, no names, no very strict significance. But this word remains. So my first question was, why the word remains? You taught me how we have to be critical thinking about this word. But in this case, I want to talk about permanence, continuity. Uh, Arcadio also talking talking about proverbs, 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 no? and then he quoted a very good one: "Eles que são brancos que se entendam." I want to ask you about another one: "De noite todos os gatos são pardos," <laughs> or "During the night all the cats are pardos." Another word that we cannot translate. <laughs> another one. Or as a kind of corruptela, a kind of, a kind of second interpretation that Ferrez, we were talking about this, Bruno, Andrea, and I, Ferrez, that is a writer coming from the suburbs of Sao Paulo, once said, A noite, I'm going to say in Portuguese and then I'm sure they, A noite na favela, até japonês é preto. During the night, in the slums, even a Japanese is black. <laughs> so, uh, what is a proverb? A 
Problem again, it's a word without meaning because most of us, we are socialized using proverbs but we, that we have no idea about the significance. But we use, we like to use. So can we say that mestizagem, uh, melange, is this kind of very ambiguous term? And that may probably one of the forces of this word is ambiguity. And if you think about ambiguity, ambiguity always had two sides, three sides, more than this. <laughs> and we could use, you use the, the word parejeros, Antonio Sergio and I asked and I, we had a hard word there trying to deal with this word. And we use malandro, that it's another word that has no, it's very difficult to translate. So why, Arcado, we are dealing with this kind of word. And these word, words that, have, that, that are very powerful. You mentioned the idea of melhorar as raças. In my country, we always use raça, like this. Vai com raça. This is a, essa é uma pessoa de raça. This is a person with race. That means this is a very strong person, not a degenerated person. Or oh, even, as I am a Corintiana, we know that all the Corintianos this is my soccer, yeah, you see? <laughs> All the Corinthians, we have race. <laughs> because we can, we can, you can look to us and see that we are very weak, but at the end, we are not weak at all. So, what's the power? How, why those words and proverbs and sentences are so powerful? Sash, Sash, I want to mention two, just two things. <laughs> When I first met Serge here in this room, he looked to me and he said, you Brazilians are too colonized. Why the hell are you going to speak in English and not in Portuguese? <laughs> and now we are speaking again in English. <laughs> and he spoke in English, not in Spanish. So I want to think about this idea that Serge is always challenging me that why we Brazilians are so colonized, and why we Brazilians think that we are not post-colonial, a post-colonial country in the same sense. Why we think that we had a different, we think we had a different independence, and then that we didn't kill our father, and we didn't kill our grandfather, and then we were not equal, we are not so different. So, why, Serge, we think, as you said, that, that melange, mestizage, is a very com complex uh, phenomenon that is very difficult to deal. But why this phenomenon is received in Brazil, as Antonio Sergio pointed so well, in such a different way in Brazil and in France? Why in Brazil, for example, when Gilberto Freire used the idea of mesti a mestiz country, he was trying to react against racial theories. In the first moment, mm -hmm. Gilberto Freire was really, had really a liberal thinker, because talking about mestizage was a way to free the country from the idea that we were uh, mestiz, so we were degenerated. So why in Brazil, mestizagem, and that's probably our, the idea of this colloquium, why mestizagem can be considered, at least in Brazil, as a kind of, I cannot translate again, marcador social de diferença. How can I translate one? A social marker of difference. Because sometimes mestizagem can be very good for us, and sometimes mestizagem can be very bad. It's our poison, and it's our like divine solution. <laughs> and then this is a way to talk with Devlin. It's also a beautiful lecture, and I want to ask you about two things. Elio uh, Seixas Guimarães is going to talk about Machado de Assis. I just, I just want to quote one sentence. There is one character from a Soviet city called uh, one of the conselheiros. And he used it to say that, I'm going to say in Portuguese and then in English, 
As coisas só são previsíveis quando já aconteceram. Things are just, how can I say, predictable when they had already happened. Other thing that I was thinking when we were talking about the famous essay of Montaigne, the cannibals, when they tried to understand why the Tupinambas wanted to, to make a war all the time, wanted to kill all the time, and at the same time, he was thinking about the religious war and trying to understand the way Europeans would make the war and make the way Brazilians would make the war. And at the end, if you read the essay, he said that at least Brazilians knew why they were trying to fight. And the Europeans had no idea about it. But at the very end, he says, this is very interesting, but what the hell, they don't, do not use pens. <laughs> so it's very difficult to deal with this idea of the we are talking about co contact, contact among cultures. So, what is happening now? You gave us a beautiful panorama. In your opinion, Deborah, what is ha happening now? Agency is a word that we are using a lot. Reception is a word that we are thinking a lot. Indigenization that you mentioned. I'm thinking about using Baba terms, how natives are now are using the same image like a new mirror in their own terms. Can we talk about mestizage in their own terms, or in our own terms? Or say, uh, I, I mean to say, can we, in, can we try to change this story this long story, this long violent story that you will write. But think about the things that are happening now in terms of creating new agendas and using this depiction, this very perverse depiction. But it's just, I just wanted to thank you, O3, and say that I really learned a lot. Thank you very much. I was trying to moderate Peter. Uh, Peter. Peter said, <laughs> brutally and gentle. Piki. Okay. So, uh, so, so, which way do you think we should go? Should we collect maybe some thoughts and comments from the audience, and then yeah. the 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 panelists can can give a first set of response? But I would like to get you all involved a little bit more. Thanks so much, Elena uh, and. Uh, so, so when, but, but the thing of the, the rural and the gentle is that I would request, demand, ask that you be condensed. Look for condensation. We all know how difficult that is, right? But try to condense yeah. your comment or your question. So why don't we get a first set of reactions from the audience, and then we will have time for Deborah, Sergey, and Arkadia to respond. I just wanted to ask um, folks if you might think a little bit about um, that the way in which Mississauga is, is simultaneously dirt in, in Douglas's sense or trespassing on the sort of fact that we take, one takes for granted that there are already racial structures that can then be mixed or, mm -hmm. um, right? So it, it deconstructs or, or really challenges that. But um, it seems like what hasn't been spoken about yet, maybe it will come up later, is the fact that gender and sexuality at least in terms of the biogenetic bases of trying to understand Mestizake, are also very, very much taken for granted that there is rape, that there is intercourse, that there is something produced from these already existing categories of gender and sexuality, especially within the heteronorm. So I just wondered if that could be put on the table or how you all might respond to that. Okay, so the question of, of how do you think of, of gender and sexuality uh, 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 related to, 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 the, to the structures in place that over the term race? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much. It was a great table. Uh, briefly, going back to these clocks and clouds uh, provocation, which I think is, is great. Uh, if we think in, in terms of citizenship as becoming more uh, open and, and cloudy in the good sense. I mean, we have more and more people that have dual and triple citizenships. We have more people displacing and moving within the Americas. 
more states that recognize dual and triple citizenship. It's not easy here. Still here when we talk when here Obama talking about mm -hmm. citizenship, it still follows a more or less a traditional, I would say, uh, track. But I think that uh, especially in Latin America, in Central America, and perhaps you know, in the future Europe, if we reconsider citizenship uh, and also the, the nation as a you know, different, non, not a 19th century idea nation, but if we go to something more cloudy, open, uh, multi, anti, I don't know. How is that going to affect or produce perhaps a much open, better uh, idea of mestizaje? mestizaje no? I, I, I'm an optimist in that sense, and I think that it's still a concept that we can uh, retrieve and appropriate and, and use in the future, I guess, in a different sense. Yes, please. Uh, you know, I love the all the presentations, but what struck me about you know the, the, the three presentations is you know basically race is the some, something you know really uh, fundamental for all this discussion about mestizaje, and uh, I was thinking about race as a kind of an equal category since uh, you know it is foundation, and uh, basically you know in terms of when you try to do operation between race, mestizaje, and democracy, mm -hmm. citizenship. You know, race is always, you know, establish this inequality through, you know, the, the, the operation. Uh, and, uh, of course, this, you know, has an impact in a way, uh, you know, people do, we, you know, these ideas of messaging and national identity. I'd like to hear something of the, the table about, you know, this idea of race as something unequal in, in its own foundation. So why don't we get a chance now for the for the panelists, for Akadio, Serge, and Deborah to respond, you know, to some of the comments and questions that uh, that the uh, Antonio Serge that you you ask, then we open for a second round of questions. Okay? <coughs> Have you got to get going? Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for, for all the comments and, and the questions. So uh, um, should I perhaps uh, respond to, to Lily with another proverb and, and uh, with another word? Can I use another one? Yeah. We have time. Let me say that, uh, that yes, you are, you are absolutely right. The, the important question of um, words that remain, and uh, I think it's a very important question because it's uh, a way of thinking uh, deeply. Uh, about um, culture and society, uh, the question of meanings, uh, not meaning, but meanings in the plural, that I think was raised by uh, uh, Antonio Sergio's talk the other day too. Uh, multiple meanings, um, meanings that uh, change continually, sometimes why, who uses the word, when, for whom, I think that's sort of performative uh, vision of, of the word, um, I am interested, of course, in words all the time, uh, as a more literary person, but also historians like Raymond Williams and key words. Uh, I am interested also in key words and key phrases. Uh, uh, in that sense, I use them a lot. Uh, one historian that I uh, admire immensely, of course, and I'm sure many of you, Carlo Ginsberg. Carlo Ginsberg. Uh, says in one of his essays, uh, the, the, the continuity of words does not imply continuity of meanings. And that's extremely important too. Uh, words are there, but the meanings uh, change. Uh, and, and so um, it's, um, it's important to, to keep that in mind because all of these uh, proverbs too, by definition, can be used to, uh, um, in, a, in a sort of pragmatic, uh, strategic way, you know? uh, who uh, uses it for whom, and what meaning does it acquire then? Um, but it raises another question too that I think is very important, and we tend to forget um, that uh, we tend to forget uh, meaning in the way we have institutionalized disciplines. You know? uh, we have an uh, entire body of disciplines. I myself was trained in that. And we talk about, let's say, the Caribbean, uh, forgetting very uh, frequently that uh, bilingualism, trilingualism, multilingualism was 
uh, is still going on in many places, and also in, in, in the case of African languages, it was just yesterday. Abolition of slavery was in, I remember reading, you know, in Puerto Rico it was 1873, but there were, uh, there, were, there were trading slaves as late as 1871, no? They were coming in, so, I mean, Bosales, what languages were they speaking? How did they learn Spanish? And, and Spanish is still being imposed, let's say, as a language. And therefore, the proverbs and the words uh, in, in, in many areas, in, in, and Portuguese too, uh, and, and, and there are new languages, Creole languages that use also, and translation is an important issue. Not just meaning, but translation, adaptation, uh, in the sense of the word. So, uh, but now I don't want. I, w I just want to, to emphasize that, that words do remain, and some European concepts are very important too because they remain in various ways. And the one I'm interested in right now is uh, the concept of the citoyen soldat, no? the way that modern nations and democracies define the citizen, uh, the citizen must go through uh, the discipline of uh, the military uh, in order to become a full-fledged citizen. And that is true, of course, of uh, batallones de pardo simulados, which we have in the islands, and guardias negras, no? Uh, it's a way of uh, becoming a citizen, uh, even though even if you don't speak very well the language, and even if you cannot use all the proverbs, but you have, you wear the uniform, and that's another language too, a very powerful one. No? That's what I wanted to respond to that. Uh, and to give you another phrase, a very important one, uh, I don't know if it's used in, in Brazilian Portuguese, we say very frequently, we meaning, I don't know how widespread it is in the Caribbean really, tener raja. And there's a gesture, tener raja, which means you're mixed, and it's good. It raja, raja, which means a uh, cut. You know that there is. It's a very powerful phrase, and it can be very, very pejorative too. It can be an insult when someone pretends to be white and someone makes a gesture. It goes with a gesture. You say so. So language and gestures uh, in in the question of. Okay. So, uh, I think Tener Raja is a very, uh, and actually Fernando Ortiz has something about that we can talk later. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to, to, uh, to respond very quickly with two, two examples. First example, uh, to respond to the provocation, uh, I did it now. Uh, every year I'm teaching uh, in Belém do Pará, Amazonia, uh, history of Mexico, 19th century, Juarez, Mestizaje, uh, separation of the church and the states, and so on. Well, I, I'm not able, I'm not going to explain why Brazilians are colonized and so on, you know. But uh, I am very stricken by the fact that two levels of languages, the intellectual elite, uh, social or academic, with a sort of debate and uh, game that, uh, and reflection that we have uh, or, uh, or, uh, today and tomorrow. And my, my, my students were supposed to be caboclos, were in fact mestizo, who look like for me Mexican mestizo, because in Amazonia, most of the origin of these people, partly African, but most of them, much more than in the rest of the Brazil, they are Indians, you know. And of course, I'm always stricken, but with my students, the level. Uh, the, 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 the vocabulary, the reaction are completely different. So I think that also we, it's important to think in terms of social background uh, to connect this academic discourse with a special form of elite. Uh, and the elite, the elite in plural in Brazil is different from the elite in Mexico, for instance. The second is, uh, example is taken from an experience in, uh, in Spain. I was traveling in uh, in, uh, in Murcia, uh, the province of Murcia, with uh, 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 students preparing a doctorate, but he was a teacher, schoolmaster, in a public school. And he was explaining to me, 
Well, in the class, a third of my students are uh, Cristianos Viejos, they are uh, uh, Catholic uh, Spaniards. The other third part, they are North African Muslims, and the other, they are Indian from Ecuador. So uh, what I mean by the mestizage is not just a problem of biological mixture, physical mixture, race or color. It's a problem also of, uh, of creating a sort of collecting imaginary. The challenge for the teacher is to, um, in this part of uh, Europe and all Europe is how to teach to these people a past that could be acceptable by Christian, by uh, ex-colonized Indians, by Muslims, you know. So, uh, uh, Mestizaje is not always, uh, and very often is not connected with a physical fact, you know. Uh, the, the new urban culture today in theatre, in music, in art, is mostly mixed culture. Much more mixed, much more mestiza uh, than the, 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 the political, uh, than the society itself. So uh, for me it's also important to dissociate, no? I mean that you can be completely black and pure and so on and completely mestizo. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that's positive or negative, you know. Mestizaje, uh, to my mind, is not a word. It, it's, uh, uh, we can speak of hybridity or hybrid. Uh, personally, I don't care. It's a problem of understanding the machine. How does it work? That's a problem. In what conditions, with what results? And there is always the danger to spend the time discussing, like in the Middle Ages, about it's what was called nominalism about definition and terms. A uh, problem is a problem of, of to know what's in the motor, what's the dynamic. Uh, in what condition it could be something supposed to be positive or something to be negative. You know? that's of, in fact, that's much more complicated. But it seems to me that it's part of the challenge, at least for us, uh, because we are in a pre, uh, pre-colonial or pre-mestissage uh, phase in a way. Uh, we, we, it's, till now it's, it could be uh, much more easier than in Latin America and the Americas to try to orientate the processes, uh, politics from, uh, from the different states, you know. So there is some possibility of trying to avoid the negative aspect and trying to uh, help, to contribute to the more positive aspects. But to do it, the, the problem is not to name it, the problem is to understand how, how did it work in the Americas, how it is still working here in the Americas, and how it is beginning to work and to expand in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, so, you know, the US is another post-colonial country that doesn't recognize it as one, right? and that's what uh, creates the kind of exceptionalism um, that we see, because, I mean, it's really, uh, that's why I use this new world language words, you know, also because though there are people who today would consider that very retro, and, um, but it signals a moment uh, prior to the World War II developmentalist three worlds model that, that took the U.S. out of being part of the Americas and a post-colonial Americas, you know, so, so that's, um, that's why I use that, those words. Um, well, I think one of, the, one of the interesting, you know, issues, of course, about race is that it's not fixed, you know, so uh, what what is happening now? It seems to me in many places has to do with movement and how uh, the elaboration of transnational processes and transnational sociocultural spheres has really influenced different ideas about um, identity and subjectivity. So you see that, for example, in Kim, Kim Simmons' really amazing work in the Dominican Republic right now about um, how, uh, you know, where Indio has been typically the category for, for, for black without saying black or brown. Uh, um, 
Uh, and uh, so she's noticing that because of migration, and even for those who have not moved, who have not migrated, um, people have moved away from this idea of India as being the way to self-represent and toward uh, toward other kinds of categories that recognize an African past, and that this then is also having an influence on state institutions like the census, right, which relatively recently um, you know, in, uh, developed a mulatto category, which had not previously been on the census. But also, you know, for, in my context, also, uh, you know, the modern blackness uh, concept is really also one that's about movement, and uh, that, that it's migration that has uh, enabled a different relationship to the old uh, class cultural hierarchies and has created a situation in which uh, working class and lower class Jamaicans no longer necessarily need to um, go to the big man, the middle class person in their community to get what they need because they're getting it from their children and grandchildren who are abroad, right? sending back remittances. So it changes um, the centrality of that group, which is also the nationalist middle class. You know, so it, it also then changes the salience of their definitions of what um, the sort of, you know, in, in Jamaica it's out of many one people, which is more the U.S. multicultural model than it is a mestizaging model. But um, at any rate, uh, you know, and those kinds of things are happening all over. So um, I think, uh, you know, movement both in terms of migration, but in also in terms of the movement and circulation of new ideas and concepts uh, is what's really changing, um, you know, not only affective relationships to race, but also institutional relationships um, to race. And I'll, I'll end just by asking, um, throwing your provocative question back at you. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know your, your name, but you were talking about retrieving mestizaje. Um, toward a positive uh, rather than a negative. And I wanted to know why should it be retrieved at all? And, um, you know, or any kind of nationalist notion of that, that uh, creates, uh, that's, that's based on race, because then uh, it, it, it reproduces uh, inherently this idea that there should be social integration that, and that racial difference precludes that social integration. And so I was, uh, you said, uh, Antonio, at the beginning of your remarks, I think, something about radical democracy. And so I was thinking, why not just move away from racial democracy completely and instead reach toward radical democracy, right, across, across the Americas? Again, the play with words, right? Yeah. Thanks so much. And I had uh, written myself in to respond. I think you have, uh, I forgot your name. You asked the last question about the uh, oh, inequality yes. built into race. March. 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 I, um, maybe connecting that with some of the questions that were asked and some of the responses. Um, uh, and it was a very interesting discussion of movement that you really brought up. I think that deals very much with uh, things that uh, Sergio was also commenting mm -hmm. about, you know, uncertainty, distinct temporalities. Yeah. You know, and uh, and coexistence, and I think one of the larger themes here that is emerging: how do we live uh, together? Meaning the living together, meaning affirming singularity, individuality, but also a sense of the public of, of the collective. And I think that kind of was interesting to hear Sylvia's question about why does the word remain? You know? And I was I was juxtaposing that to the previous point: what's suppressed? You know, in it remaining, but. But suppress, and I think it was interesting just your your perspective, Deborah, of, of what's new, the movement, you know. But the movement has already been there. And this is so beautiful thing, Sergey. Sergey's mm -hmm. comment: the movement has been there, and the movement is hidden in that process, right? Uh, do you know that Deborah from there is a bit, right? So it's, it's already affirming a certain kind of a certain kind of. But what about, but what about the figure of the immigrant? You know, but something I was always asking Peter, say, okay, all about you know the mulatta, miscegenation. What about the immigrant? You know, well, Brazil is a country of, of, of immigrants as well. How do they figure in? You know, that came to my mind with this yeah. Japanese being clustered together with the Preto, you know, and that's a, it's a it's a more complicated reality on the ground of coexistence and struggling 
you know, to, to make, to go ahead, you know, to have Russell, so to speak, you know? And I think, I think the, the suppression of that is also linked to the question Sergei meant about, you know, there's, there's regionalism and there is an elite that also tells the story. So what, what uh, Didier Fasser would say, there's an inequality built in to lives, and there's an inequality in who tells the story, who is allowed to tell them yeah. the story. So, so that's also part of the discussion, I think, of mestizage and racial democracy, of those names, is like who actually is telling uh, the story. So, Peter. Yeah, I, I had a, two quick questions, actually. One is uh, a reaction to Sasha's uh, provocation about nominalism and political correctness. I have a great sympathy for, non for medieval nominalism, actually. And I was wondering, I mean, uh, we, we know that the founding moment of nominalism, as we know, as we better record, know better than anyone else, I mean, is the moment uh, we don't have the robes any longer, but we still have the name of the robes. So I, and I, I, I guess that this same question could be asked, I mean, regarding Misty Satin. Uh, we perhaps don't have the same expression, uh, the, the same uh, living phenomenon, but we do have the word. The word is sort of hovering here. So what to do when the rose or the mestizagem has vanished? What to do actually with that word? And this uh, connects to my second big question, which is about the fact that they brought uh, at the very beginning uh, two scenes, uh, which is uh, Rosa Parks and then the Sidian and and then uh, that streetcar and then Jorge Bastini's uh, description. And of course, I was not referring to, I hope I, I make myself clear again, I was not referring to a real experience, but uh, I think we are in front of two different myths, I mean, two different moments of the myth. And when we talk about myth, we talk about the world that is hidden in words, as I think Jean just, uh, just uh, uh, referred to. So. Uh, and that's perhaps something to be thought of uh, in terms of this discussion of uh, regaining a moment or re recuperating, recovering the concept. And we are talking about myths, different myths, we, we, and, and different mythical foundational moments that somehow trigger different histories of political action, of what even a, 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 a modern citizenship can be or should be. Let's collect a picture. Uh, I just wanted to make a brief comment related to what Deborah and, and, and Lillian said and what Pedro just said, which is, what do you do with the fact that the majority of people in a country believe in a myth yeah. profoundly and live it, and it's the way they organize their lives? Is our role to say, no, you're wrong? Like, forget this. He's actually yeah. you're politically incorrect, and we as the vanguard will correct you, and we will explain how your society is? Or what do you do with that? deeply imbued cultural notion of society as it functions. I mean, the fact that Gilberto Freire and others, and it wasn't just Gilberto Freire, managed in a very quick time to totally upset a series of racist ideas that were very imbued in, in the leadership of the culture indicates that there was something else going on that allowed that to happen so quickly. And so I think that in a, in a lot of ways, my, I guess my question is, do we, do we do we throw out this, this, this notion and turn our backs on the fact that many, if not most, people in many countries of Latin America think this is their reality and tell them they're wrong? Or is it an element of this whole question? I just want a follow up on that. Um, I, I think this, this panel has been fantastic and it shows all this, this various meanings of this society. And I think, you know, following on Jim, I mean, I think it's important. The, the myth we're not going to get rid of, um, the word we're not going to get rid of, and I think it's something, that, uh, a term that has to be appropriated, uh, just like a lot of terms that might be negative have been appropriated for social movements. I mean, this was a very progressive, you know, like Jim said at, at the beginning, but it's also something that has very positive value, like, like Serge uh, uh, noted. And so I think, you know, it's, it, what we have to do is expose the myth. And I think expose the myth throughout Latin America and I think even in Brazil, and I, I think among academics that, that, that develop these ideas of miscegenation, I think it's shameful, I mean, not just shameful, maybe it's, it's, it's the fact that so many academics are against affirmative action for reasons that I think are, are, are fueled or, or understood because of these ideas of miscegenation and racial democracy. 
But that's just Brazil. But other countries are way off. I mean, I mean, I think that from what I've, see, I've seen, the discourse in Mexico is just way on the other end. I mean, this idea of miscegenation is just something very positive. These are all terrific comments and questions, and we will not put the burden on our panelists to, to, to re <laughs> no. respond, because that's the burden on all of us for the next two days to, to deal with this question. Does have the other? No, I just wanted to call attention to the idea that what we have to do as intellectuals, uh, there are a lot of people who are racist, and uh, we don't have to respect you know, that there is a majority in certain social groups that are racist. Uh, I think for us, maybe more uh, important to understand what Sert was saying, you know, to understand the dynamics of mestizaje, to understand how it works. And I wanted to add another scene in public transportation that is a scene in a very famous essay by Fanon. In France, in Paris, he's on the subway, and a, a little kid looks at him and he says, a black guy, that's a black man, that's a black man. And then he realizes that he's black. He didn't know that he was black and that he was put in that situation, which means uh, that race is not necessarily defined before mestizaje. Uh, for my my uh, uh, intervention has to do with you know encouraging us to question the terms we, we are using, because I think that's what we are doing here, trying to understand how it works. Could, could I say? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily actually agree that um, the majority of people um, believe the myth. Um, I think that, you know, like um, most ideologies, there's often a, um, a level of acceptance of it on one hand, but, uh, you know, so for example in Jamaica, um, the national motto, out of many one people. If you asked people, are we a Creole multiracial society, they would say yes. But at the same time, um, on a daily basis, they espouse other ideologies uh, and uh, express in other kinds of terms through their day-to-day -day existence that they know that it is an unequal society and that there is racial discrimination that correlates to class discrimination. So, you know, I don't think, uh, I think the, what, what, uh, the hegemony is a very fragile one that's based on an elite imposition of that ideology, um, but it's always contested. That, I mean, that would be my experience in Brazil, actually, also, at least in Bahia, so maybe it's a place thing. Mm -hmm. Can I follow this? Just to follow this. To Bahia, yeah. It's a question to James, in fact. Uh, I'm, I'm also done. I'm not sure if um, people in Brazil believe in racial democracy. I'm, I'm not sure. But I'm sure, for example, that all polls that we have, the majority of Brazilian people in Bahia and otherwise are in favor of racial politics, that is, in favor of quotas for black in the university. So the question is, if people continue to believe in racial democracy, they nowadays they believe also that quota and race policies are necessary. So uh, this is the question, not um, on the belief on the myth. I think. Uh, maybe, maybe, could you tell your uh, your study that you had done? Like, are you a racist or not? No, no, it's, 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 it's a fascinating study that they Yeah, did. because Sorry. we, I, I, well, if we're going to start, if we are going to start to talk about myths, I think that we have different meanings of myth here also. Because one thing is thinking about myth like a false ideology, yeah. false idea. The other meaning of myth that we can use is the Livistro's idea of myth. This is the structure. And then you use the meat because when you have meat and the meat remains, the meat, if the meat is alive, it's because the contradiction that it was in the beginning of the meat is still alive. So I don't think that you have to say that racial democracy is the opposite of thinking about discriminalization hierarchy. No, it's not. <laughs> but I'm in very much concerned with the idea of this kind of myth, like a structure, like a cultural and historical structure. That's why we had, a, we organized the, I think most of you 
uh, and then Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery in the Occident, as you know. And then uh, when we had our 100 year celebration, we organized a research that we asked Brazilians about prejudice. And the first question was, do you have prejudice? And 96% of, 90, of the answers were no. And the second question was, do you know a person that has prejudice? And 99% of them said yes. And when we asked them, if you said yes, try to, to, try to, to give a definition of kind of relationship you have. And so people wanted to, but we didn't ask for names. People wanted to give names, like my father. That's my mother. My mother would never enter in the lift with a black person or my boyfriend. So the informal conclusion of the research is that every Brazilian thinks he is a racial island of racial democracy, surrounded by racists everywhere. <laughs> That's the meaning, because I'm not a racist person, but you are. I'm sure about it, and you are. In Bahia, they are terrible. We were talking about this. When we live in Sao Paulo, we say, in Bahia, they are terrible. They, when they live in Bahia, they say, in Sao Paulo, they are terrible. When we are uh, like in big towns, they say, in a small town, oh, it's ugly, it's disgusting. When you are in a small town, they are going to say, big towns are terrible. So this idea of putting in the other the idea of prejudice and describing him or herself uh, as a really a racial democracy. So in my set, the way I think about myth, there is nothing to do with the, with the idea of, and we are not saying, this kind of people that describe themselves like racial, that they think themselves like racial, that they are Democrats, they are not saying that they are not discriminatory, they know about it. And that's the perverse thing. I'm not defending, I'm just collecting the idea. So we have Arcadio and then everybody then I had. I just want to follow one, one just real quickly. Okay, so I don't think Americans are any different from Brazilians in that sense. <laughs> they don't think they're racist, especially in post racial society and everybody else. Okay, great. Arcadio and then Just uh, um, just to add perhaps a bit more uh, on the question of uh, words that remain and, and suppression, uh, I would add the, the need to think about silencing, because suppression very often is what words, concepts, and individuals or groups are being silenced, and how uh, the society silence. You know, Michel Froff Trujillo wrote a beautiful book uh, on Haiti, uh, on silencing of history, which I think is very important, too. But going back uh, to your question about gender, because I think one of the great silences, at least in the mestizaje that I'm more familiar with, is of course silencing uh, violence, and, and si silencing uh, violence usually against women. No? Uh, that's uh, a very um, common silence that one finds very difficult. Um, Toni Morrison, uh, you know, very important uh, for so many reasons, but she always spoke about the unspeakable and the unspoken. And I think those are very good concepts to, to talk about these words. Words that are unspeakable, and uh, rape being one of them, and, and uh, violence against women in mestizaje, a very powerful, um, a, a very powerful silencing, I would say, there, no? Even in, in even in the in the lyrics of salsa and salsa is songs are very important, no? Extremely important. Not just words, but the music and the songs. And if we listen to many of the lyrics of salsa that celebrate um, mestizaje, or uh, sometimes that violence is not there, no? It's that foundational violence, let me put it that way. And and uh, and the same is true for the for another. Uh, discussion here that uh, was initiated now on the question of movement, uh, because the question of uh, movement now very often we use the term diaspora, but very often and diaspora became in the in the early 90s a very powerful term among academics too uh, to refer to migration, uh, but very often. Uh, and let's say, I, I will call this a postmodernista version of, of diaspora. I, am, I was not, and I'm not a postmodern uh, 
scholar in that sense. And, and one of the reasons I was not was that I was always uh, uh, uncomfortable with the idea that everything was so smooth and so nice and we just went back and forth and diasporic communities uh, went back went and returned and, and thought about. And there's a certain, uh, I'm, I'm doing a caricature here, but because it is a very useful concept, diaspora, but very often the violence that some groups suffer is absent because it is not the same for the elite who talk themselves as diasporic communities and the working class. No, we go there to the question of class again, and sometimes the violence when crossing the borders and to become a diasporic individual. No, so I would I would say that, and the same is true for for the notion of the, another word, freedom, because many ab radical abolitionists in the 19th century in Cuba and Puerto Rico, they were abolitionists and they wanted, but they used the metaphor of freedom to refer to themselves uh, too. I mean, there was a sort of double language there because they were really against uh, Africans in their country. They wanted, uh, and the Cubans particularly, they really uh, developed in incredible plans to send uh, former slaves back to Africa. Uh, and yet they use the metaphor freedom from bondage to refer to themselves in regards to the colonial country. So you can use a metaphor, uh, a very important metaphor, bondage, to refer to the elite, which was very prevalent, you know, and not to the slaves themselves. That's uh, another layer of complexity there. Okay, so, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to Thank you, the wonderful panel. And at this point, I just want to summarize some of my thoughts. First of all, I think it's very important. Us, mestizagem is a very big word. We need to do a gen genealogy of, of what concept of mestizagem we are using. Because what I felt is that we can use many concepts uh, using the label mestizage. And sometimes we are talking about very different concepts. For example, I even don't know exactly when the word mestizage appeared, because it's not mestizo as the colonial period used to mix it people. As in English, there are no exact translation for this word. So we are in very, you know, ambiguous uh, terrain. But, you know, we know that mestizage is based on race. And race is a very empty concept, as um, Deborah told us. But it is empty because it can be reinterpreted in each context, always serving to exclude. Otherwise, we don't use this kind of concept. And I would like to finish saying that in a country of um, racial democracy, we have a very strong black movement now that recognize themselves as black and Mestizos or you know mulatos now are recognizing them in a different way. So I guess the discourse of integration, mestizage is very linked to the formation of the nation. We are now another voices. And as Antonio Serge told us, the movement for quotas now, the affirmative action in Brazil is very strong now. So we have to think how in a very racial democracy as Brazilian society, we have so strong movement. Okay. Let's go back to a few more questions. Yes, please. Okay, so I want to ask a question. Um, first, I want to tell you just a story that happened to me recently. That I went to Brazil this Christmas, and uh, I went to visit a museum there in my hometown, in Belo Horizonte. And uh, the brand new museum that was inaugurated by the government, federal, the state government, and it has two floors. The first floor is about the Mineiro artists, the artists from that state. And lots of writers, and we're very proud of our poets, our writers. 
And the second floor is the Mineiro people, is the theme of the second floor. And when you enter the second floor, the first room you have is a dark room that shows a video, and everyone sits and watch a little video. And the first sentence of the video says, uh, modern science has proved that there are no races. They're just one race, human race. <laughs> yeah. And that's the first, and this, but immediately after that comes a sentence that says, the Mineiro people were created by three people. The Africans, they... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I looked around me and no one seemed troubled by it. And uh, it is this idea that they don't think it's genetic, but at the same time they yeah. think Everyone thinks that there's some essential thing about black men. Yeah. And that there's an essential thing, maybe there is the true black dude doesn't exist today anymore, but it at some point existed in the past. And uh, going they have back, sculptures. Yeah, going back to, to what Antonio Sam said at some point, and the discussion about Mr. Sahin and uh, is it something that we should embrace, something that we should denounce? Either way, you embrace or denounce you have to, even the people who denounce Mr. Simon has have to, or many times, use the idea of the essential blackness to, to denounce it. They say, mm -hmm. they look, look at black people here, they're different from black people. Mm -hmm. And that's why Mr. Simon doesn't work. And um, so I was wondering how can, going back to what Deborah said in the beginning, about Du Bois and Cyril James trying, trying to dis deconstruct this idea of blackness, is it, so, is it possible that we can actually arrive at the radical democracy that he's proposing with, and still keep this idea of the essential blackness without deconstructing that idea? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any more questions? Yes. So um, I know that um, the word miscegenation has been translated in Spanish and Portuguese. But I just want to push back on this notion that there doesn't exist this word mestizaje or mestizaje in English. Because when you look at you know, the United States, you think about the way that we talk about, mis about race mixing, it's been in a very negative context, right? So of course we've got very different histories and approaches to thinking about this concept, but I guess I just want to push on this idea that, oh, race mixing as a concept never existed in the United States. Because it did, and there was like legislation and pushback against it, right? Like, part, a lot of the you know foundation of Jim Crow was based on this notion of preventing miscegenation. So I just wanted to like, have you guys comment on that a little bit. Because we, we say it doesn't exist in the US, but it's like, but it really did. Yeah. 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 It's great. That's great. How do you like to comment? Okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Can we yeah, yeah, of course. No, we'll continue the conversation the next day, but yeah. I want to have a chance yeah. to have five minutes yes. because uh, yeah. Yes. 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 yes, we are good, we are good, we have time, we have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have six minutes and a half. <laughs> okay, so we'll do good. Okay guys, so be, be good, be condensed to the time. <laughs> Leave us with your best. <laughs> So it was, can you get rid of a notion of black essentialism and have some kind of political can system? We, can we get to democracy without getting rid of the idea of black mm -hmm. Eliminate it. <laughs> well, I can't answer the question. I can just tell you what I believe. Right? I believe nationalism is bad. Right? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, any, all, all of the nationalisms in the Americas and really, um, you know, drawing from the universalisms of, uh, well, the, the combining of the universalist ideas with the experience of colonizing the Americas, it means that nationalism is always bound up with ideas about race, racial essentialism, racial mixing, racial compartmentalizing, um, and, and this is why I feel nationalism is bad, right? And why I would look to scholars and activists who have created other kinds of notions about political community, 
within nation states or transcending them for more radical ideas about what it means to be human and what it means to be in relationship with other humans, what it means to recognize rights of individuals while still living in collectivities. So it's an idealist answer, you know. Um, I know, I realize that, but, um, you know, I, I get, I'm just really tired of um, <laughs> all of uh, the discussions um, uh, that, that are geared toward figuring out ways to deal with the diversity, right? Because diverse, and you know, I only say this because it's institutional also. I mean, it's every university, well, I don't know what's happening here at Princeton, but every university campus is struggling with this, and there's so much pushback, and there's so, there, there's, uh, there are only so many committees that I can be on, you know? And there's only so many times I want to have the same conversation over and over. And, and so I guess there's like a fatigue of dealing with the notion of race as a problem, and it only becomes a problem because it's attached to citizenship, right? You know, so that's, I guess, what I would like to move out of. Sergey, do you have to respond briefly to Marilena's provocation about the, the concept that we have been working with and uh, the question of miscegenation in America, <laughs> in the United States of America? To be another conference, just uh, Interesting for French, the, 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 the word appeared in the 13th century, Middle Ages, in France, talking about Métis, uh -huh. where supposed to be people from different origin. In that time, uh, France was not a nation, it was a small kingdom, and uh, people from Brittany mixing with uh, people from Flanders were supposed to be Métis. Uh, no, I have no time to answer to your to, to your comment, just the fact that uh, when we are in Europe discussing between Europeans, it's a big problem because métissage exists in Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French. It doesn't exist in Dutch, German, English, <laughs> etc. Means that, uh, of course, words are, uh, exist and are problems. And especially in that case, because the fact is we are. We are, uh, we are not anymore a series of nations. We are the European Union. That means that we are supposed to create something else. A nation is almost dead in Europe, but we have nothing else. And just I would like to, to say that uh, we desperately need meat to share, you know, to learn to live with each other, you know, something collective, you know, for these people. Uh, who are not Christians, uh, who are coming from a part of the world, who are now European citizens, as I am, you know. So, uh, means, uh, even if uh, they are just creation, but everything that we are doing is a creation. When we are writing history, we are inventing the past. We are building the past. If it can be useful for one, two, three generations, I think the justification of heavy myths. But we, that's why I'm very interested in, in visiting the, the American market. You know, the, what, what are we going as European to buy? Uh, uh, Democracia racial or, 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 or uh, uh, communitarism and so on. That's why you are so interesting uh, uh, for us, you know, because we, are in the situation of having to invent something and avoiding, of course, uh, the negative effects that this myth uh, had in uh, the American countries. Uh, just uh, a word about uh, miscegenation and, and laws, the legal uh, Question. I, I'm always struck by, uh, I'm le always learning. Is, uh, I'm sorry that Terra Hunter is not here today because we, when we met in Sao Paulo, I, I heard uh, a wonderful paper, uh, part of her book on marriage and uh, uh, in a post slavery society in the US and how long it took. Uh, and she was framing it in such a way, a very fascinating way, because the debate. On, um, on gay marriage, too, seems very similar, you know, sort of, who has uh, patria potestad over the children first? Is marriage possible? Uh, is, is divorce possible? And all kinds of issues. And even worse, when there is a question of uh, races, no? and how marriage was forbidden by law 
uh, and not only between white a white person and a, uh, an African American person, but also between slaves. Uh, a very long, complicated history uh, that uh, that and I thought this is very important because in the going back to the to let's say the the Iberian uh, colonies to marriage, even though there were no uh, it was it's a very very complicated history that has been studied a little bit too. Uh, because we have a lot of mixing, but not always and not frequently under the institution of marriage. That's important, because the most common thing among members of the elite is to have, of course, the legal official marriage, and here too, and to have to be a mancebado with a, for men with a black woman or a mulatto woman. And that lasted very, very long in the Caribbean in the 20th century, extremely long. So, so there was a mix in there, but not necessarily institution, because marriage, there were limitations, clear limitations, legal limitations also to marriage. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have to keep that in mind, because that's another false opposition, let's say, uh, between the US and the laws against miscegenation and a sort of ideal world at least in the Caribbean, about uh, uh, mixed couples, no? Uh, there was the question of legality, and, and I think one more thing, because it has not been mentioned enough, maybe today, that the silencing has to do, of course, and the legal and miscegenation with the whole issue of sexuality, no? Which is behind this. I mean, the, uh, when, when, you, when Eddie Taylor said, let's expose uh, the myth, well, how, how far can we go exposing it? Because it has a lot to do with sexuality and our idea of what is possible, what can happen, and what happens between human beings. You know? And I think that's a very central issue that has to do with violence and legal limitations and constraints uh, and um, religious beliefs too. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a complex issue. But, I mean, you're right. That is one significant issue. Uh, when we talk about to compare and to uh, trespass. On that note, trespassing, thank you so much.